Um, one of the things I forgot to mention last time, uh, a young man named Russ Lollier, his mother and father used to own Lollier's Drugstore in Gunnison, has done a whole series of great videos that, on the railroads that deal with the Gunnison country, and I'll just mention some of the titles. Number one is Race to Gunnison, South Park and the Rio Grande coming into Gunnison in 81 and 82. Uh, one is called Gunnison City. One is called North to Anthracite. Railroad running all the way up into Smith Hill, and you can see moving footage of the water tank and uh, all kinds of stuff around Jack's cabin. It's just great footage. Uh, the other one is called The Quest for Crested Butte, and that deals with Crested Butte and the Floresta branch, and he's working on uh, a couple of others right now. And if you're interested, those are at the Crested Butte Museum. If you want to look at them, uh, they're over there. I uh, brought along with me today, as I did last week, I brought the Irwin thesis by Walt Borneman last week. Here is a thesis by Carl Haas on Gothic. 280 pages or so, complete with maps, <laughs> mining information, pictures, the whole kit and caboodle. So what I'll do is, when Bruce is finished, I'll put that on the table along with one other book that I forgot to bring last time, which is uh, Ellen Dobbins' book on the diary of Garwood Judd in Gothic. Oh, yeah. So I'll, I'll put those on if you want to take a look at them. Uh, please do. Also, we have uh, papers at Western State, and I'll make a little list of this for you next time. We've got a very nice paper on Floresta, one on Schofield, one on Anthracite, one on Pittsburgh. They've all been done, uh, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And a lot of the old timers were still alive at that time, so uh, it's really meaningful. Uh, today, we are going to start off with a good buddy of mine, uh, Dr. Bruce Bartleson taught at Western State Geology for 33 years. Uh, he's the guy that goes with me on the uh, San Juan mining trips every year. We uh, work well together, kid each other a little bit together. Uh, Bartleson on February the 19th will be uh, moving into his ninth decade. That means he's 80, gonna be 80. And if he falters today, <laughs> I'm going to pick up the slack. <laughs> so he has a great slideshow on the geology of the Crested Butte area and the Gunnison country. With no further ado, Bartleson, you're on. We're gonna, you want the lights off right now? Yeah, leave the lights off, please. Lights least, off, sir. At least those Thank you. in front. Oh, is everybody safe in here? I wonder. <laughs> Let's see. You know, I could, could you come up here and help me out? <clears throat> Now, let's see. We just want to move through the arrows, that's all. See this arrow here? So here's the first slide. See that? That's, yep. That's the back arrow, there's the front arrow. Okay. okay, here we are. First, we're going to do a little bit of uh, real history. Dwayne's going to talk about the last, what, couple of hundred years at the most. I'm going to talk about the last, well, you can take a look here at the bottom of the age. Uh, <laughs> Actually, the Gunnison country only starts about 1,800 million years ago, maybe 1,700 million uh, years ago, 1.7 billion, okay? Geologic column, this is how geologists talk about time. We talk about the Precambrian, we talk about the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic, okay? We subdivided those into various periods, and you can see the dates, those are all in millions of years there, okay? So that's how we're going to start here, and you can see some of the uh, major events in history. Notice that the core of North America is assembled uh, by a serial collisions of crustal blocks. Uh, we'll talk about that. Well, let's go to the first slide, okay? As a matter of fact, then, here is, here's the beginning. If you notice, this was about 1.8 billion years ago, 1,800 million years ago. This is what North America looked like. That is all that stuff that stippled or with the wavy lines. That's how North America was. If you look closely, you'll see the four corners in there. And uh, 
right above the word edge. And that, of course, is the four corners of New Mexico, Arizona, uh, Utah, and Colorado there. And uh, you can see that Colorado <clears throat> at this time was not a part of the continent. We were offshore. We were getting deep water muds at forming at this time. Next slide. OK. We became a part of the continent during what they call the Great Plains orogeny. Now, the word orogeny, don't, don't get excited. It's, it's, it's not spelled with an E, orogeny. It means a mountain building event, OK? So we have a mountain building event. What happened here was a, a, probably an island arc crushed onto the side of the continent. And that's when Colorado became a part of North America about 1.8 billion years ago. Now, we have rocks around here which are of that age. And here they are. Here are some of the oldest rocks in Colorado. Next slide, please. There they are. There's the oldest rock right there in the front. <laughs> I resemble I resent that. Excuse me. That's really a good picture, Duane. You know, that's all right. Yeah, that, of course, is the painted wall of the Black Canyon. That's the famous Black Canyon schist. Those rocks are about uh, 1.7, 1.8 billion years ago. They were intruded by a series of granite dikes. That's what makes the painted wall. Those, sla those bright slashes are granite dikes cutting across the rock. That occurred a little later. But those are rocks that represent that original Great Plains orogeny 1.7, 1.8 billion years ago, OK? So we're talking a lot of time here. OK, next slide, please. OK, now we, we're going to jump on. We're not going to spend too much time on the Precambrian, even though it takes up a huge amount of geologic history. We're going to go now into the Paleozoic era. Here's the Cambrian. And here was the, what the continent looked like. Again, you can see the four corners in the middle of the screen there between Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. And you can see that there was a, what we call the Cambrian time. There was a sea off to the west. Notice that California, Utah, Nevada, all of the Pacific Northwest was offshore, OK? And slowly, a sea came in towards the continent. And Colorado was slowly invaded by what we call a transgressing sea, a transgression. That is, the sea was invading the continent, coming uh, ashore to us. So the next slide shows a picture here. Here's some stuff called the Sawatch Sandstone. This is on Cement Creek. If you go up Cement Creek, right opposite the Cement, Cement Creek summer homes, and go on up the side of the hill opposite that valley, and you're, so you're looking at the old Cement Creek ski area on the other side of the valley, you'll see these rocks here. This is the Sawatch sandstone. And these, as you can see from the slide here, they represent beach near shore deposits. And this is the beginning of a vast inland sea covering much of the continent. Notice the hammer for scale. And there's what geologists call swash-type crossbedding. That's typical of a, of a beach environment or a, uh, the water going back and forth, sloshing back and forth, swash crossbedding. Next slide. Weird little creatures, they are more like, um, what, what's the modern thing like them? They're uh, hermit crabs. They're kind of like a hermit crab sort of organism. That was the dominant form of life. So if you were here back then, you wouldn't have had too much to eat except seafood, OK? The land plants had not formed yet. There were not any land animals at this time. All we had was sea life. So if you were a seafaring person, you'd do well. Next slide. Uh, this is on Dead Man's Gulch, up Spring Creek. And here is the, almost the entire Paleozoic section here. That is, uh, those rocks range from Cambrian up through Mississippian at the top. In the middle are Devonian rocks called the Chaffee Formation, or what the people in that county call Chaffee. Okay? And the next slide shows you a picture of those. Here's some animals that were around. This, this is during the Devonian period. And so anyway, what we're getting to is this. The Colorado is part of a vast inland sea, and this is going to persist for several hundred million years. So uh, here we are uh, in a shoreline environment all this time. And the seas, as it turns out, come and go frequently. It doesn't stay submerged. There's uplift, minor uplifting. The seas retreat. They come back, back and forth. As they say in historical geology, the seas came in and the seas went out periodically. So those are, those are animals, <laughs> There's, oh, our monthly report is ready. Yeah, those, those little animals there, are, most of those are called brachiopods. 
the ones right, the one right near the paper clip is a brachiopod, and the other fragments, the one up in the upper left is called a bryozoan. Okay, those are the dominant forms of life at this time. Again, we have mostly sea animals around. Next slide. Oops, I, okay, there we go. I'm going to name them for you. Keep on going. This is fine. There you go, bryozoa, good. And that ought to get us to the... <laughs> I like to play with those arrows. They're fun. Okay, here's what the country looked like. Now, one of the maximum times of, of transgression was during what we call the Mississippian, approximately 340 million years ago, maybe a little older than that. And you can see that much of the country was a shallow li limey, like in calcium carbonate, like corals and uh, limestone, uh, like the Bahamas, okay? So this is what our country looked like at this time. Notice off to the east, though, something was going on. There was some activity in the Appalachian region and something going on in the west coast but for the most part the country was as it shows a very shallow limey sea so it was very pleasant here at this time it would have been it would have been nice you would have had a good time next slide <clears throat> here's um, anybody been up rosebud gulch well, Dwayne and I have been there more than you. there's a good bike you go up dead man's then you can go up to rosebud and then you go to the um, Julie Andrews trail right right near Cement Mountain, and th this is the upper part of Rosebud Gulch, and that's the Leadville Limestone, named for the town of Leadville, and in this particular case, th this represents those Mississippian sea deposits there. They do have fossils in them, and it's kind of a, uh, a, a nice uh, formation to fool around in and break some rocks and see if you can find some crinoids and brachiopods and things like that. Next slide. Bruce, just a quick comment. Yeah, shoot. Uh, Leadville Limestone, that's where all the great marble deposits came from. We'll talk about a little later on. And White House Mountain is just, I think Bruce would agree, a lot of lead building. That's right. <laughs> yeah, here's, here's one of the forms of life that you see. These are not local, as it turns out. These are awfully good sample. These are called crinoids. They're sometimes known as sea lilies. And these were a very dominant form of life. In the, you find these frequently in the Midwest. Uh, this is where those came from, as a matter of fact. But we do find fragments. Uh, these look like they're plants, but they're actually an animal. Uh, th there was a little living tissue in there, and those little arms had cilia that grabbed things as they went by, microscopic stuff for the most part. Okay, next slide. Now, something happens. Somewhere around 300 million years, million years ago, for reasons not entirely clear, uh, the shallow seas ended, and... Uh, the western part of the United States was broken up into a series of mountain ranges called the Ancestral Rocky Mountains. Not the modern Rockies. These are the Ancestral Rocky Mountains. And they're going to play a very important part in the history of Colorado because they form some very important topographic features around here, as a matter of fact. Okay? So we have this mo these mountain ranges pop up. Notice there's kind of a a sea in the middle of Colorado, the light color is supposed to be a sea where it says evaporites, and then notice at the four corners there, you have evaporites, that's called the Paradox Basin. The basin in between the two ancestral Rockies is called the Central Colorado Basin, right in between those two mountain ranges. And we're kind of right on the edge of that one on the left side, the, the, the left side of the ancestral Rockies. Okay, next slide. Well, one of the formations that formed as a result of those mountain, of those mountain ranges was called the Gothic Formation, named for the old mining town of Gothic. Um, and this formation consists of a series of conglomerates and sandstones and shales and sometimes some limestones. And uh, we think that those cobbles like that, you see they're all full of big fragments. We think those formed an alluvial fans so next slide, what's an alluvial fan? Well, that's an alluvial fan right there, okay? We think that the ancestral Rockies were right opposite Crested Butte, just to the west of us, that is the east flank of what we call the Uncompagre uplift was just to the west of here. And so the Gothic formation formed as a series of fans like in, right in here. At part, only there was a sea where there's a desert out here. This, of course, is Death Valley, where there's a seaway, there was a seaway during the Pennsylvanian time. So if you had gone a little bit to the east of here, you'd get into a shallow sea, only there would be alluvial fans right along the mountain front. Okay, next slide. Well, if you go up 
Copper Creek, about two miles or so, where you first cross the creek as you're hiking up towards Copper Lake, you go about two miles and you cross the creek, look up to your left, and you'll see, and I think there's some arrows that'll pop up, push the, the button, oops, never, go back that if you would, please. I can point these out if you, there's a bunch of bulges, there's one here, one here, and then there's a big lens right above my head, okay? Uh, those are actually reefs. <laughs> yeah, so we had these alluvial fans right near the mountain front, right near town here, and then a little ways offshore, like up towards Copper Lake, we would have had some reefs growing at this time, okay? So we had this nice shallow marine environment. Okay, the next slide is a close-up. There's that, that biggest reef. Uh, we can't just call it a reef. We call it a bioherm. It's a fancy name. It, it, it's, it's a reef-like structure, okay? Okay, that one's 55 feet high, by the way. Okay, next slide. You can also see ripple marks, which show that there was a shallow sea swashing back and forth. Okay, next slide. And then finally, as time went on, the ancestral Rocky Mountains slowly wore down. So now we're about 270 million years ago, as you can see. And as a result of the wearing down, the central Colorado basin in here started to fill in with sand and gravel. And guess what formation formed? Next slide. That one, the maroon formation formed on top of this Gothic formation, okay? which was more shallow sea, and the basin slowly filled in. That, of course, is uh, the maroon bells there. The next slide, this is taken from West Maroon Pass, looking at Pyramid Peak. The bells are off to the left. We're looking down the West Maroon Creek Valley there. So in this particular case, if you start here and measure the thickness of the maroon formation, and notice that the beds are kind of tilted down towards Aspen, you're going to find about 10,000 feet of sandstone and gravel that was deposited in this basin as a result of the wearing down of the ancestral Rocky Mountains. So that's what the maroon formation, uh, Tiakali Mountain, maroon formation. Uh, Avery Peak, the front of Avery Peak is maroon formation, okay? So you're very familiar with these rocks. So the ancestral Rockies gave us a lot of our present topography. Now, originally think though, remember that this was part of a shallow sea and a basin so something had to happen later to get it uplifted, right? I mean, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of history involved here that we have to get to. Next slide. Yeah, um, on the other side of the ancestral Rocky Mountains, on what we call the ancestral front range, there was also a series of red beds formed like the Maroon Formation. That's called the Fountain Formation, and that's the flat irons of Boulder, of course, is, is a similar deposit formed at the same time, only all the way across the ancestral Rockies over towards Denver. So they had the same thing. Next slide. If you go to Uray, you'll find what we call the Cutler Formation. That was on the other side of the Uncompagri uplift going into the Paradox Basin, going into Utah. And uh, this area right here, we'll talk about a little later, that's the blowout. That's an igneous intrusion which came in much later and produced some mineral deposits and there's some mines right around there as a matter of fact. But here again, this is the, the, these are the red beds of what they call the Cutler Formation. It again is the same age as our Maroon Formation, only it's on the other side of the Rocky Mountain uplift. Okay? So time goes on. We're zipping along here. We're up to the Jurassic already, 200 million years ago. And because the continents move, through time, we get into different latitudes, and when you change latitudes, you change the climate and you change the environment completely. And in this particular place, we, time, we get into a, an, a, a, a part of the Earth's globe where sand dunes are liable to form, and so as a result, a great sand sea forms across the southwest. And uh, rocks that form in Zion and Bryce and so on form at this particular time. And the next slide shows you an example. Yeah, there's the Navajo sandstone at Zion National Park. Uh, that tree is about 40 feet high, by the way. So those were great big dunes forming. Each one of those is a separate sand dune set that blew across the top of an older sand dune set. So there's a, there's a change, there's a break here, and then there's a break a little farther up and so on. So you get a series of crossbed sets showing the wind direction going back and forth through time. Next slide. Here on Cabin Creek, just east of Gunnison, about six miles, we have a 
small deposit, only about 20 or 30 feet thick of what we call the Junction Creek sandstone. And that is a part of this great Jurassic dune field that existed, which was much bigger to the west of us in Utah. But we had, we had sand dunes around here at this time. So we've changed from a shallow sea to the ancestral Rockies to a filling in of the basin. Now we have sand dunes blowing around in, in this part of the world. The sandstone is found around here too. Okay, by 150 million years ago, <laughs> time flies. Here's the four corners again right here. We have a vast floodplain. Uh, sand and gravel is being transported from southern Arizona and southern New Mexico and going to the north, northeast. And uh, a very famous deposit forms called the Morrison Formation. Next slide, please. There is the Morrison Formation right there. Those brightly colored or the light colored material. There's the maroon down below. Uh, there's the Entrada or the Junction Creek right over here. And then that's the Morrison Formation. That's the Morrison. This is a series of lake and floodplain deposits. But what they're most famous for, next slide. What they're most famous for. <laughs> oh, the arrows wanted to come up. OK, that's no problem. OK, here actually is a, a road cut of the Morrison Formation. This slide's a little washed out. It doesn't show the colors. This is really kind of a pale green and pale red color. This is an old slide. I'm going to have to redo this one, I guess. Uh, but anyway, this is along Highway 50 west of Gunnison. That's the Morrison Formation. Some of you old timers will remember about 10 years ago, this whole thing caved in. They closed the highway for a while. The whole wall fell down and they had to move the, the, the road for a while. Uh, but that's the Morrison Formation. But at any rate, what the Morrison Formation is famous for, I, I got one slide out of order in my head. Go ahead, next slide now. Oops, <laughs> there's a stream jet. Here it is. Yeah, uh, just east of town on Cabin Creek, we found one of our students, in fact, two of our students, Ken, uh, Ken and um, his brother, Snyder, found a small, uh, they were looking for arrowheads. And they found a little tiny bone kind of sticking out of the ground. They started digging. And pretty soon they got picks and shovels. And pretty soon they got a little bobcat. And they turned out to find a whole series of bones, maybe 40 or 50 bones from a, what we used to call a brontosaurus. OK, nowadays it's called an apatosaurus. But there was a major dinosaur found. This is just, uh, just about a mile up Cabin Creek, um, six miles east of town there. And this is in the Morrison Formation. Uh, we, we had a naming contest for the dinosaur. And one kid came up with Morris thesaurus, which I thought was a pretty good name for a, an apatosaurus. OK, well, here's a picture of an apatosaurus here. <laughs> there's an apatosaurus, there's a herd. And so we would have had these guys galumping about the, the Gunnison country at this time. Yeah, so, so anyway, there are land animals now. By the way, the, uh, the vertebrates invaded the land somewhere in the late Paleozoic. So we started getting amphibians and reptiles. And pretty soon we got to the age of dinosaurs by the Jurassic. So if you'd been here then, there would have been very good, uh, there would have been a lot of hunting. Uh, you would have had a lot of meat from one, one shot here, I think, if you could have got this guy. That would have fed the whole town, I think. What do they weigh? 40, 50 tons, those guys. Yeah, we used to call that brontosaurus, but we found out that there was a, the same animal was named twice, and uh, the proper older name was apatosaurus. Okay, next slide. Uh, another famous fossil, this one actually came from Canyon City, although this picture is taken outside of Dinosaur National Park Visitor Center near Vernal, Utah. But we have a very good example of a Stegosaurus near Canyon City. Beautiful example of this animal. You, you've probably seen these guys before. Uh, they got the big fins on top, those plates. They think they might have been to, to gather sun. Not quite sure, though. Perhaps it was the males had them for sexual attraction. We don't really know. But there's various ideas. At any rate, notice the head of this guy. It's a little teeny tiny head. And interestingly enough, this probably has the smallest brain of any major land animal. I mean, the brain was the size of a marble. Okay? In fact, he had a bigger set of nerve endings in his tail. Well, interestingly enough, the state of Colorado state legislature named this the state fossil.
you think I'm making these things up. This is taking a lot of time, but what happens now is a, uh, <clears throat> we have a major separation of the continents is what's happening at this time. Pangaea, where all the continents came together, breaks up somewhere about in this time. And as the, and as the continents break up, the mid-ocean ridge rises in the middle of the ocean in, in between the continents, and this causes sea level to rise. So there's a great flood coming across the country during the Cretaceous. And again, you can see now, we have what we call the Western Interior Seaway cutting through. Here, here's the four corners again. Here we are in Crested Butte, Colorado, right there, or right there, okay? And so now we're underwater once again, okay? Uh, so if there were any dinosaurs around, they would have had to have fled to the shoreline in either direction. Uh, we do find some marine reptiles at this time around here, by the way. Yeah, there's, there are things like plesiosaurs. Okay, well, what happens next now, there's, there's a good example of the Morrison Formation with brighter colors. That's one that has the dinosaurs in it right in here. Now, this next uh, bed up here, this is taken right above Gothic, by the way. This is uh, right near Avery Peak. And that big sandstone cliff right there is called the Dakota Sandstone. And that turns out to be the beginning of the advance of this Western Interior Seaway coming in during the Cretaceous. So next slide. And if you go up there, you'll find that there's ripple marks and there's all kinds of little fossils in there. So proving, again, we're going back to a marine environment once again. So we've gone, again, through various phases in time. We had sand dunes just a little while ago in the Jurassic, then a big floodplain during the Morrison time. And now the Cretaceous Interior Seaway comes in and floods our country once again. But that's going to make some very important deposits for Colorado also. Next slide. Yeah, so here's the seaway coming in. Now things are going off on the west coast, as a matter of fact. There's a series of islands which are colliding. See, it says collision right there. And uh, places like the Sierras are starting to form, or at least are getting some of their major rock types forming at that time. Again, though, we're, we're talking here about mud forming. <laughs> we're a sea of mud at this time, and the mud that formed is this deposit, the next slide. <clears throat> yeah, uh, this is an aerial view of flying above the uh, town of Montrose, the Black Canyon, the end of the Black Canyon's right over here, okay? And these are, this is called the Manca Shale, and you've seen this around here. The next slide shows you an example. Yeah, anybody seen the East River Falls just below Gothic, right? I think some people even kayak across those things in high water, right? Some insane people do, right? Right, okay, well that's the Manca Shale right there. That's the result, and if you drive the road between Gothic and Crested Butte, uh, up from the ski area up towards Gothic about halfway at a place called Rosy Point, where you get a nice view of the meanders of the East River, that's the Manca Shale right there, you're seeing that spot. But that's a good example of the Mancas. Okay, next slide. Well, as time goes on, as I say, things are happening to the west of us. Mountains are starting to form out in here. This is what's uh, called the, the Cordilleran orogeny here. We're getting the severe uh, orogeny forming. But at any rate, around here, we're getting a shoreline, and we're getting deltas, and we're getting coastal swamps all along through in here at this particular time. And this makes a very important impact on Crested Butte history because the Mesa Verde formation, the next slide, the Mesa Verde formation, this is near Paonia Reservoir, this forms and what goes along with these coastal swamps, this is a delta channel coming out from the uplift, but what also happens at the same time, next slide, is in these coastal swamps you get coal beds forming. Yeah, coal forms. That's a big six or ten foot coal bed up there. Uh, this is actually near Helper, Utah, but it's the best coal bed I could find that was exposed around here. But at any rate, as you all know, Crested Butte owes its origin and its, and its livelihood for 50 years to coal, right? After the mine shut down in the 1890s, it was coal that kept the town going all the way into the 1950s. Next slide. So we still have some coal, like near Somerset, although this mine is closing down, as you're probably aware. What is, I think this is, this is the Oxbow Mine. I believe that one is now defunct. But uh, anyway, this was a major source of tax revenue for Gunnison County for many, many years from the coal. Next, next slide. And here, of course, is Crested Butte. 
in the early 1900s. This is a little fuzzy, but I think Duane can talk about these. These are the Coke ovens right here, right along the bench. How many Coke ovens were there, Duane? 154. 154, 154 Coke ovens. You can imagine what the smoke must have been like at that time here uh, as they were burning the coal to go into Coke. Next slide. Here's another picture of those Coke ovens. And there's, so we're looking towards Crested Butte Mountain right there, as you can see. So this is what caused that coal, was the, these swamps formed during the late Cretaceous called the Mesa Verde Formation. Next slide. Okay, here is North America about 65 million years ago. Uh, this is a nice, <laughs> a nice graphic. Uh, you can see the country doesn't quite look the way it does. Notice, for example, Florida is largely underwater. Uh, and there's mountain ranges forming here. We're now going to form what's called the Laramide orogeny. That's what's going to make the modern Rockies starting about 65 million years ago. Next slide, please. Yeah, and here's what's going on. Earlier, we had what's called the severe orogeny. I mentioned that earlier. That's when there was stuff going on when we were getting our Mesa Verde formation over here. This was happening in California and so. And then a little later, say around 60 million years ago, what happens is what we call flat slab subduction, at least that's the major idea. There was a plate of the Pacific Ocean called the Farallon Plate that dived under, subducted underneath North America, and it slabbed on some rocks like this. That's called accreted terrains. And then there was volcanism out in here. And then where we are, because of this Farallon Plate moving horizontally, what happens is you get compression. Notice the compression here, and you get overthrusting, and you get mountains <coughs> popping up like this. Well, this is what forms our modern Rockies. You get compression to the west, and foreland ranges out in here like this. And so um, this is what forms the modern-day Rockies around here. Now, we're especially interested in this area. Next slide. Because we have some significant, because of the compression, we get what's called a thrust fault. You can see the beds are being twisted and crunched. And in here, right here, this bed is slid, has slid, been thrust up over the other one. You can see those thrust faults. And notice that some of these beds are actually upside down because of the thrusting. When you move one plate over another, the rocks get crumpled up, and so the rocks end up getting overturned like this. Well, we have this right here. This is exactly what happens in the Elk Mountains, all the way from Mount Sopris near uh, Carbondale, all the way down to... Uh, Crested Butte, the rocks are overturned here and there because of this compression. Next slide. Here's an aerial view just north of Redstone where the beds have been tilted up. This is mostly the maroon formation, but here the beds are nearly vertical. Next slide. You come a little farther and here's what's happened. This is on the, this is Perry Creek. This is just south of Gothic up on that ridge going towards White Rock. And if you notice, we've got the Gothic on top of the maroon. The beds are upside down here. If you drive between the ski area and Gothic and look to your right, you're going to see a series of beds that have been done like this. They've just come, been completely turned over. Okay, So everything's upside down. <laughs> yeah, there's the maroon formation. Here's an aerial view taken from uh, the top of the hill above the Jack's Cabin Divide area, and you can see Round Mountain and Crested Butte. And notice right in here, you've still got these beds dipping vertically. You know, normally beds are lying horizontally, right? Like on Cement Creek, you'll see layer cake type geology. But here, along the Elk Mountain front, and this is part of the Elk Mountain front here, only it's coming south. And so we've got these beds turned up on their, on their ear, literally turned up, almost overturned right in through here. That's called the Crested Butte lineament. A lineament is a linear structure in the rocks. Next slide. You can see the, the result of this. It continues all the way south. This is the structure at Taylor Park Dam. And you can see there, probably many of you have stopped the dam and looked at that and wondered, what is going on there? Well, these, this is part of that structure zone. These rocks are going like this in here. They're being twisted and turned around because of the compression from that Farallon plate sliding underneath the western part of the United States. Okay, um, yeah, just for fun, I threw in a picture of the dike, okay? 
cutting through the Wasatch Formation. What happens, the Wasatch Formation, which are these red beds at Mount Owens and Ruby, are uh, those are the result of uh, alluvial fans formed as a result of the modern Rockies being formed, okay? So remember, we had the maroon formation from the ancestral Rockies. Now we're having the, what's called the Wasatch Formation, making red beds in a very similar fashion to the maroon formation, and only it came from the modern Rockies. So that's, that's a result of that. Okay, next slide, please. Later, as the uh, mountain ranges formed, a series of basins formed in between them in, from various places. This is up in near Parachute, Colorado, and the famous Green River Lake beds formed. Green River Lake, named for Green River, Wyoming. And a series of marls, you know what a marl is? A fine-grained, limey mud formed. So big lakes formed in between these mountain ranges at this time. And this stuff, though, course, <laughs> produced oil shale. Now that's not to be confused with shale oil, right? Oil shale consists of a compound called kerogen, which is a solid rubbery hydrocarbon, which is called the pyrobitumen, which means if you heat it, it turns into oil, okay? But it's a solid material. It has to be heated to turn into oil. And many of you old timers can tell me how many times there's been an oil shale boom in Colorado. <laughs> what do you think, three, four? <laughs> We've had booms, and it never has worked out yet to, the, to, the, to any extent. Uh, it it's, takes too much energy. You have to mine the stuff. It requires a high temperature. You've got to heat it to about six or 700 degrees. Uh, the stuff, there's a lot of oil. There's, there's billions of barrel tied up, but it's solid. It's not really oil. It's stuff called kerogen, okay? And so it, it uh, looks like I, uh, Shell Oil just recently had a program about five or 10 years ago. They, they walked away again. Like I say, I don't know how many times oil companies have come here, looked at this, spent $20 million and left. So these are the famous oil shale deposits in Northwest Colorado. All right, here's kind of a, an, a crude geologic map of this region. We can, here's Crested Butte right here. Okay, there's the East River. There's Almont. You can see Gothic where the square is, marble, redstone, uh, Aspen over to the right. And the red, the red color on that map represents, because of the rise of the modern Rockies, because of this compression from the Farallon Plate, the maroon formation, which was buried deeply, covered by other sedimentary rocks, the Morrison, uh, the Mancus, the the Dakota, uh, the Mesa Verde all covered it. This area is uplifted because of that compression. And so the modern Rockies from and all that red color on that map, all that red color represents the maroon formation. So most of the Elk Mountains are actually maroon formation. The, what makes them really spectacular though is they were intruded by a series of magma bodies, molten rock, this orange rock represents an intrusive. Molten magma came up from below and pushed up into the maroon formation and formed some of the impressive peaks like White Rock and like Capitol Peak and Snow Mass and so on. Those were formed because of the intrusion of these igneous bodies. Granite came up from below, bubbled up from below as a result of the heat going on down below as this slab of Farallon Plate slid underneath the western United States. Okay, next slide. Yeah, that kind of shows it. There's Snow Mass right in the middle. You can see how it gets its name. Okay, that's that snow mass mountain there. And you can see the, the gray rock is the snow mass body. That's called the snow mass stock. It's just a big blob of granite, like the Sierras, that came up and has no particular shape or form. It just makes a big blob and intrude into the maroon formation. You can see the maroon formation right here in this particular case. I guess, is that, I guess that's the bells right there, or a pyramid, one or the other. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, here is a good picture of the snowmass stock. And in this particular case, the, there's snowmass mountain right there. And here you can see it's intruded into the Gothic and the Maroon formation right here. In this pl place, this is taking your trail riders pass. Uh, here the beds are more or less horizontal and right side up. They haven't been turned over in this particular area. Next slide. Here's the White Rock stock looking up Copper Creek. The 
gray area is the granite that makes up White Rock Mountain. So that's, that's a part of one of these intrusive bodies that came into the peaks there. I think that would be, um, what is that, Duane? Yeah, it's Castle. It's either Castle or, I think it's Castle Peak, yeah. Right, which is maroon formation, by the way. Okay, next slide. All right, now, what's a picture of a tree doing in this area? <laughs> I thought this was a geology lecture, right? Well, okay, one of the most famous aspects of the Gunnison country are an unusual igneous feature called a lacolith, L-A-C-C-O-L-I-T-H, a lacolith. And it, it's an igneous body which came up and instead of being a big blob like the snow mass or white rock stock, it has a definite shape, a mushroom shape, dome-shaped top, a flat floor. That's called a lacolith. To a geologist, anyway, it's called a lacolith. Well, we have a lot of them. There's about 20 some around here, as a matter of fact, of lacoliths. But that's a good example of what a lacolith should look like if that were a piece of granite. Okay? All right, next slide. I'll show you some lacoliths. Yeah, there's one right there. <laughs> Crested Butte Mountain. You can see the flat floor very nicely down below there, right in there. There's the flat floor of the Lacolith. This was taken my first year here when I was working on my thesis in 1962. I think he had a sawmill going there at the, at the end of Elk Avenue, right? An uncle of yours, yeah. <laughs> uncle of yours, okay. <laughs> I, I remember that little sawmill working that summer. This is summer of 62, and there's, there's the Lacolith. It hasn't changed too much, has it? Next slide. Here's Crested Butte Mountain looking from the, uh, from the Gothic Road, looking north, I mean, from the north, looking south. And do you see anything odd about that picture? What's that? No ski runs. There's no ski runs. This was taken in 1962 before the ski area. Well, actually, they had just put in the first lift over on the, uh, what did they, they had the, uh, the T-bar then, didn't they, in 62? And it was a rope tow. So anyway, they had not developed this side of the mountain yet. Yeah, this is all ski runs now. Also, there's also something else interesting about this, this picture. This, of course, area here is the north face right in through here. And there's the peak of the mountain there. But if you notice, there is a series of little niches. Like there's one right there, and then one there. I wish I were taller. And then over there. You see those? Those are actually fracture lines. They're big faults. If you look at a map, a geologic map of Crested Butte Mountain, You'll see some black lines drawn all around the west side of it. <laughs> Those are actually faults. And as a matter of fact, Crested Butte Mountain is falling apart. <laughs> I'm not chicken little. Yeah, those are what's happening there because the East River is flowing along just to the side of this. It's undercutting the whole side of the mountain. And because you've got granite resting on top of Manka Shale, which is fairly weak in plastic, Crested Butte Mountain is actually cracking and sliding into the East River Valley that way. It's very slow. You don't need to worry. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, <laughs> is anybody from CBMR? Your mountain is falling apart. <laughs> OK, next slide, please. All right, uh, Ga here's Gothic Mountain, which is also a lacolith. And notice here, there's a, a little body here right below it, which is separate, called a sill. That's a tabular, a plate-like igneous body, which is going below the mountain. But the main top, the base of the mountain is right there. So that's Gothic Mountain. That's also a lacolith, and with the sill below, uh, taken from around Avery Peak. There's a nice view taken from around the top of uh, Owen or Ruby, looking at Marcelina. That's a lacolith. And I like lacoliths. And the next one is East Beckwith Mountain. There's Lost Lake over there on the right side over there. There's Lost Lake. And so uh, you can see these, these are all lacolists. Gunnison Mountain, uh, Land's End, okay, Whetstone, those are all lacolists. However, Mount Emmons, or what you frequently call Red Lady, is not. All right? That's mostly sedimentary rocks with an intrusion down below. It's really not a lacolith. But, uh, all the rest of the mountains around there are lacoliths. Snodgrass is another. All right, now, another feature which pops up around 30 million years ago, we're getting into the modern days now, we're almost up to, almost up to Duane's age here. Uh, 
uh, about 30 million years ago, a great big volcano formed just west of, of Gunnison, west of Crested Butte. This is called uh, the West Elk Volcano, and the orange deposits are all mostly mud flows and landslide deposits coming off here. The center is a, a igneous body, and all those red lines are a series of dikes, that is vertical walls like the dike near Kebler Pass. These are vertical walls of granite that cut through the existing rocks. So the West Elk Volcano, all those pink bodies on there, by the way, are the, the lacoliths of the Gunnison country. Every one of those pink ones there is a lacolith. You can see Crested Butte. There's Crested Butte Mountain there. There's Snodgrass. There's Gothic. Okay, there's Whetstone. All right, there's the Anthracite Range, et cetera. Carbon Peak would be there. Got the idea? Gunnison, Mount Gunnison is there. That's Gunnison. Land's End is to the left. Okay, next slide. So at any rate, this volcano forms, and one of the prime features of the West Elk Volcano was this, what we call the West Elk Breccia. It's a series of landslide, mud flow, debris flow, some stream deposits coming off of the flank of the volcano. And we mostly have these things as a result. Deposit, you can see there's layers in here. There's various beds forming in here. You can see the layering. And this, of course, has been eroded deeply by stream erosion and by frost action and so on. And so as a result, the fins stand out. But that's the castles. And we're looking at the anthracite range over here, okay, of the upper Ohio Creek Valley. Next slide. Yeah, up Mill Creek. Actually, Mill Creek is down below here, and I'm at a place called Land's End, looking, looking to the north. Here you can see the layered deposits of the West Elk Breccia. These are, this is, there must be 20, 30, 50 different mud flows, one on top of the other, which came off the flank of this volcano. Uh, geologists call these mud flow deposits lahars. Uh, they're fairly famous. Uh, in modern days, there was a lahar that came off of when Mount St. Helens erupted, as a matter of fact. And it went into the Toodle River and uh, caused a lot of damage. So the mud flows are one of the, one of the big problems with vol People think about lava flows killing you. It's not so much the lava flows. Frequently, it's the, these lahars. They're uh, a slurry of mud, volcanic ash, and rock fragments coming down the side of the mountain that frequently forms when a volcano erupts, or sometimes even if there's a big, heavy, rainstorm or a sudden melt of the snow on top of the mountain, you'll get a, a slurry coming down the side of the mountain. So uh, in fact, in the Pacific Northwest, near Seattle and Tacoma and so on, towns like that, the big danger is not so much the volcano erupting as it is these mud flows coming down. And that's what formed, that's what came out of the West Elk Volcano, these great big mud, form, mud flows. Next slide. If we had been living in Gunnison or Crested Butte at this time and looking to the northwest, we would have seen something like this. There's the West Elk Volcano 30 million years ago. It's actually Mount Shasta, okay? But that would be what it would have looked like if you've been sitting in the streets of Gunnison looking to the northwest. You would have seen a mountain probably 15 to 18,000 feet high. By taking modern comparisons with volcanoes of the same type in the Pacific Northwest, like Mount Shasta and Mount Rainier and so on, and comparing it to the slope and the deposits that we have today in the West Elks, if you reconstruct the West Elk volcano, it comes out 15 to 18,000 feet high. Okay? It would have been a very big mountain. So that would have dominated the landscape around here at this time. Would have been great skiing. Okay, another very important feature of what's going on during this time is that we get minerals forming as a result of all this igneous activity coming up from that Farallon plate going down and causing part of the lower crust to melt. Magma bubbles up, and along with the magma, molten rock, you frequently get mineral deposits coming along. And one of the most famous features of Colorado, of course, is after they started mining, everybody noticed that there was a very distinct trend called the Colorado Mineral Belt going up from above Boulder. This is Gold Hill, uh, Ward, and so on, and it goes all the way down through Colorado, down towards Durango. Rico and so on, there's the La Plata's. All of this is part of what we call the Colorado Mineral Belt. There are some major exceptions like Cripple Creek and um, 
Well, B Bonanza is really kind of off. Summitville is kind of off of the mineral belt. I, I would have put Lake City in the mineral belt. I don't know why this guy drew the line. I would have made it a little bit farther that way. <laughs> but at any rate, most of the mining in Colorado forms along. And it turns out there's a reason. If you map the basement rocks, that is the Precambrian stuff like we find in the Black Canyon, you find that there's a series of fractures running through Colorado that go northeast, southwest. So when that magma came up from below, it found the, this weakness in our crust and came up along those fracture systems. So a lot of fluids, hydrothermal, hot water fluids carrying minerals came up, and that's what formed the mines at Leadville and Gothic and Crested Butte and so on. Okay? Here's the Colorado Gold Rush started actually in what, the, well, really during the 1850s. You'll, you'll be talking about that more later. Yeah. But this is, this is an early picture of a miner. Notice the, the, the burro here. That's what everybody was using. And uh, uh, <laughs> what, at one time, how many thousand people were swarming through Colorado all together, Duane? Yeah, you know, they, while you're at it, Bruce, the, uh, the burros, one thing I'll say <coughs> a little later today is that it was not uncommon <laughs> For Aspen Valley Railroad, for 500 burros or jackasses to make their way from Aspen with ore to the railhead in Crested Butte, and then take supplies back over East Maroon Pass into Aspen. Wow. That, that animal, without that animal, one of the most courageous, hardworking animals that weren't treated very well, without that animal, the mining rush would never have occurred. Thank you. Ah, here's a picture. Here's some gold in quartz. Uh, mu much of the gold, gold anyway, typ typically forms in ve quartz veins. Quartz. Quartz is a that bright colored light material. You all know what quartz looks like glass, only it really isn't. It's actually harder than glass. It's a mineral. And anyway, the gold is over here. Over here, this is the gold deposits in here. Uh, there's some other stuff in here. This is probably sphalerite, the dark stuff in here. Maybe some pyrite over here. Uh, yeah, this looks like pyrite down here, which is fool's gold. There's the real gold over there. And so you get the idea that we have veins of quartz coming up that come through the, as the magma body comes up. It pushes the rocks above it, and these rocks then fracture here and there. And so some of this hot water solution flows into these veins, in these fractures, and fill, forms dikes or veins. And if the chemical composition is right, the temperature is right, you'll get gold forming in those quartz veins. So a lot of the deposits around here are veins. There are other types of mineral deposits, however. Uh, there are some that are called dis disseminated, like the molly deposit on Mount Emmons is actually not really in veins, but the molly, the molybdenum, came up and kind of disseminated or dispersed throughout the sedimentary rocks above it in little tiny deposits, small little globules here and there. Okay. Here's a picture of the Forest Queen mine. Uh, <laughs> you know those guys, Dwayne? <laughs> <laughs> that would probably be about, what, 1890, 1888, somewhere uh, in there? You know, that's probably a little earlier than that. And uh, when I finish up on Urban today, I'll be talking about the Forest Queen. How many people in here uh, have ever heard of a guy named John Hahn? Uh -huh. Grand old gentleman. We're going to finish off with John. OK. All right. OK, now, things change. Somewhere starting about two, a little over two million years ago, for various complex reasons, which take a lot of time to explain, the Earth turned colder. It actually started turning colder earlier in Antarctica, like 20 or 30 million years ago. But the North American continent, starting about two million years ago, started getting ice forming. And th that's a long story. But and it, just take my word for it, this white stuff here is glacial ice. And this was the last major glacial advance, which was around 20,000 years ago. And again, here we are in Colorado, right down here we are, right there. <laughs> There's the four corners again. Here's the mountains. But notice that much of the northeast part of the country, there's Pennsylvania right there. And you can see uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan and so on. And much of the New England states are under ice. There were vast sheets of ice forming, coming down from Canada. And also they formed, though, see these light blobs in here, they formed in the high mountain country also. So we had continental ice sheets 
in much of the country, but in the high mountains we had valley glaciers or mountain glaciers forming because of the temperature and the altitude that we had here. So uh, we get glaciation in Colorado while the New England states and the mid upper Midwest is under thousands of feet of ice. In fact, in some places the ice was as much as 10,000 feet thick up there. And when the ice melted, by the way, the crust actually slowly rebounded back up again. And it's still rising in places like Norway and in Hudson's Bay. It's kind of rebounding from the weight being taken off. Okay, next slide. Well, here is a picture I took a long time ago, 15,000 years ago, in fact. Uh, here's Park Cone, here's Taylor Park. That's, th that's the Sawatch Range right there. Okay, here's Taylor Park. And of course, actually, this is taken from Cross Mountain. And um, uh, this, would, this would be a kind of like what Taylor Park would have looked like 15,000 years ago. Only instead of those clouds, it was glacial ice. And probably wasn't quite that thick, though. Okay, but that's, that would have been, there would have been valley glaciers coming down from all over the mountain, all from the Sawatch Range. Uh, Valley glaciers came down from Red Mountain Creek, Texas Creek, Willow Creek over here, and so on, and they filled up Taylor Park with ice. Glaciers came down through Crested Butte also. Next slide. Oh, yeah, let me show you something first before I get into Crested Butte. Here's the Rhone Glacier in Switzerland, and this is melting bad, badly here. You can see there's some deposits right along here. These rocks here with that red arrow, that's called a lateral moraine. At one time, the ice was that high. Okay, and rocks falling off the top of the cliff there came down and slabbed and formed a deposit along the side of the glacier. That's called the lateral moraine, okay, along, along the side of the valley. Well, we have those around here. The next slide, please. Yeah, here's Crested Butte Mountain. You've seen this picture before. Here's this, the golf course. What's this? This is a lateral moraine right here. Yeah, glacial ice came right through town, down the, down the Slate River, one, one branch came down along the East River and around the backside of Crested Butte Mountain, but we're looking at the Slate River lateral moraine right here, and as it turns out, the glacier ends just south of the golf course. But that's a nice lateral moraine. Those are deposits that fell off of Crested Butte Mountain and slabbed up along the side of the glacier uh, when the glacier came through Crested Butte, down the Slate River. Now, another type of deposit you get from a glacier is the end moraine. You can see here's a, a, a glacier here. It's called the Schoolroom Glacier in the Wind Rivers. But at the very end of the glacier, you get this deposit that wraps around the edge of the glacier. Okay, that's called the, the end moraine or the terminal moraine. Well, we have one of those just south of the golf course. Next slide. Yeah, as you're... There's Crested Butte Mountain over here. We're driving up Highway 135. We're just about two or three miles south of town. And here is the end moraine, the terminal moraine for the glaciers coming out of the Slate River Valley. There it is right there. Okay, right there. Here's a close up, next slide. Getting a little closer so you can see that little wall. You've probably seen that a hundred times. Did you know you were looking at the end of the glacier there? Huh? <laughs> How about that? Okay, that's the terminal moraine, the end of the glaciers. Everything down below that is outwash, stuff washed out from the side. Okay, go up. Next slide. Now I'm, now I'm driving up towards the ski area. Actually, I'm coming back from the ski area, looking back towards town. And here's the cemetery, Crested Butte Cemetery right here. Have you ever noticed there's kind of a little ridge right here that comes along and goes through and comes up to the north side of town right along there? You know what that is? That's what we call a recessional moraine. As the glacier slowly melted back, starting about 15 or 12,000 years ago, the glacier retreated and it stopped right around, the, right around there, right around the cemetery, it stopped and left a little mound of debris. That's called a recessional moraine. Okay? So your cemetery is actually built on a recessional glacial moraine there. Next slide, here's a, here's a closer view of the cemetery and the moraine. I'm, you're looking back in towards town here, but there's the moraine right there. And you can see that that ridge is very clear. Okay, next slide. Also, between that little recessional moraine and the terminal moraine near the golf course, just south of the golf course, there's this big wetlands area, right? Well, I'm pretty sure that this was probably a lake at one time. That is, with the ice up in the valley retreating, when the ice started retreating up past the cemetery, as it would melt, it would run into that other moraine near the golf course, which would act as a dam, 
And so this big flat area here, which we call the Crested Butte Wetlands, this area here was probably a major lake. And there might have been good fishing even right in that lake at that time, only this is about 12 or 15,000 years ago, okay? Yeah, Glacial Lake Crested Butte, Crested Butte Lake, okay? Um, if you go up Cement Creek, maybe about 10 miles, you go past the second narrows, right? You go up the second, you keep on going way up, past the turnoff to Reno Divide, keep on going up. And after a while, and now there's a, there's a bike path that goes right along through this. Duane and I took this trail this summer. And for the first time I noticed this as I was riding along my bike, I stopped and said, God, Duane, here's a moraine for Christ. <laughs> Look at that, I never noticed this before. There's, there's a beautiful little moraine. This is a recessional moraine or maybe an end moraine right here on, on Cement Creek. There's, uh, this is all debris of the maroon formation. But this is a nice little terminal moraine uh, on Cement Creek. Uh, it looks like the ice got to about that far down from Italian Mountain and from up uh, the, the Cement Taylor Divide and came down and stopped there. It probably did not go down to the, the, the narrows, the second narrows of uh, Cement Creek. Okay. Uh, other features, here's the East River Valley. And of course, here is a beautiful example of a glacial valley. Uh, you can, and here's a cirque where glaciers formed at one time, came down through like this, but the main valley is all eroded and scoured out, makes a nice big flood plain. It's what we call a U-shaped valley caused by the glacier coming down the East River Valley. This, this glacier, by the way, went around the backside of Crested Butte Mountain and also ended up about the same place that the other terminal moraine did near the golf course. Okay, so next slide. And here's where the glacier came from. You've seen this before, that's Emerald Lake. This is known as a Tarn Lake. I'm standing right near Schofield Pass, looking down valley. And this was the source of the glacier. And then the glacier went all the way down valley, all the way through around the backside of Crested Butte. Yeah, so Emerald Lake is actually a glacial lake that formed as a result of ice forming in the valley there and scouring out the upper end of the East River Valley right near Schofield Pass. Pardon me? I, I don't know. It could be because the glacier could have scoured it out, but I, I doubt that it's more than 100 feet, but I don't know. Does any, <laughs> I, I, I really can't say. Yeah. Here's the, here I'm standing right near Paradise Divide, and actually not quite at Paradise Divide, but I'm looking down the Slate River Valley, and the Slate River Valley also is a beautiful example of a glaciated valley. You can see the use this hand, you can see the scouring and the U-shaped feature. That's because the Slate River, which went all the way through Crest, that's the one that came through Crested Butte. Slate River Glacier came through town and ended up just south of the golf course. So this is the headwaters or the head ice of the Slate River Valley. Okay, uh, at one time, by the way, we do find woolly mammoths. They, they found a woolly mammoth up near um, Cerro Summit one time in some of those deposits. So we probably had these animals. There were also giant bison, cave bears, uh, various animals of, of, of Pleistocene age. So we had uh, some major features around here. These, well, again, this would have been good hunting too. That, that, that would have been a whole winter supply there for half the town, I think. You get one of those guys. All right. And here's, I thought I'd throw this slide in for fun. Here's the winter of 1896. I, uh, Dwayne, which one is you here now? Second from the right, there he is right there. there there's there's Dwayne. Uh, I took the picture, of course. <laughs> Winner in 96, that was it. And finally, here we are, two old grizzled timers here looking up at Crested Butte Mountain. There's, Crested Butte, there's a backside of Crested Butte right there. And there we are on the Ferris Creek Trail uh, above Cement Creek. And I end with this slide, this thought here for you. You can read that for yourself. The seeds of change. So that's what happens around here. We've seen a lot of change around here. We started out with shallow seas. Well, originally we're not even part of the continent, okay? <laughs> then we became a part of the continent 1.7, 1.8 billion years ago, okay? Then shallow seas crisscrossed across Colorado for many years. We had crinoids and trilobites floating around in the sea. Then the ancestral Rockies formed. 
the maroon formation formed, right? We had sand dunes come across here during the Jurassic. The Morrison formation and dinosaurs occurred. The Mancus, the Great Cretaceous Interior Seaway came through and formed mud through this region. The Mesa Verde formed as a result a little later of deltas and we had coal deposits forming here in Colorado. Then we had the, what we call the Laramide orogeny. When the crust crumpled up, we had compression. The Elk Mountains were formed. The Wasatch Mountains were formed. The Sawatch Rain formed and so on. The Front Range formed as a result of that. And then we had volcanoes like the West Elk. Okay. Um, we had mineral deposits. And then finally we had glaciation. And most of what you see today is because of that late uplift and because of the glaciation. It's the glaciers that really carved the topography and made the Rocky Mountains so rocky. That's, that's why we look so spectacular around here is because of the glaciation and the late stage erosion as a result of that. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell us, was it that same glaciation that formed a long lake, a meridian lake? Right. That's, that's interesting. I, I almost took, put a picture in, in there of that, but I had so many pictures of glacial features, I decided to leave that one out. But yes, that's a, what's happening there is you've got two sandstone beds of the Mesa Verde formation going like this, and there's a shale bed in between. And as the glacier came down the valley, it scoured out that shale selectively. And so you, you, it, it's kind of a glacial scour feature. It's fairly unusual. But because the beds are tilted like this in there, you got more resistant sandstone beds on either side. As the glacier came through, it just kind of scooped out the shale. It's called differential erosion. <laughs> so yeah, that, that is a glacial lake. Right. Jim, you had a question. I have two questions. Uh, I've been told Nicholson Lake is extremely deep, but I know that's uh, one of those I don't know. So you don't know? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Can't second, help, I'm sorry. The second question is I've been told two things about Round Mountain, one that it's a lacolith and one that it's no. a volcanic cone. Right. It, it's what we call a, a rhyolite plug. It, it's not a lacolith. Uh, we thought it was at first when we first came out here, but when we started looking at it more carefully, we could tell that it was not. It's actually, it's kind of a cylindrical feature of, of, of well, it's what we call rhyolite. It's a fine-grained version of granite. So it is kind of the throat of a volcano. Yes. It probably vented at one time. And Carbon Peak is a... a carbon is a lacolith. Okay. Yeah, Carbon's a lacolith. Right. A nice one. Carbon, the anthracite range, Axtell, those are, those are lacoliths. Whetstone. Tamichi Dome? Tamichi Dome, no. <laughs> Tamichi Dome is a flow dome. Uh, when magma comes out to the surface, if it's very sticky, like rhyolite, it just kind of mounds and bulges, and so it forms into a dome. It's actually a, we thought it was a lacolith for quite a while until we went up there and took a look at it, but it's very different. If you look at the rock on uh, Tamichi Dome, it's very, very fine grain. It's basically a glass, so it cooled very rapidly, and anything that cooled that rapidly didn't form below the surface, right? Crested Butte Mountain, Gothic Mountain, cooled 5,000, 7,000 feet below the surface. So you get nice big crystals of feldspar in the granite of Crested Butte Mountain and Gothic Mountain and all the rest of the lacolites. I guess it cooled more slowly. But Tamichi Dome is just a glass, formed very fast. So it's what we call a flow dome. Good, good question. And then, like, it fooled us for quite a while, too, until we finally decided to go up there and take a look at it. Oh. Other, sorry. <laughs> yes. Other questions? Bruce, thanks a lot. Uh, that's that's fan fantastic. <clears throat> Folks, I want to take the remaining time and uh, finish up on Irwin. Uh, we got about 10 or 15 minutes, so we'll finish up on time. I left off on, on Irwin last time when I told you that that lake was called Lake Brennan until about the 1950s. And then it was renamed for Dick Irwin. Uh, nobody knows how it got renamed, but it did. But for a long time, it was called Lake Brennan. Uh, everybody knows uh, what exists right in behind it. You got those three great mountains in behind it. You got Green Lake, you got Scarp Ridge. You got some very difficult real estate. At its peak, Irwin was a mile long 
23 saloons, seven gambling establishments, and some very pretentious buildings that were made out of frame, were frame buildings. It wasn't just cabins. So of all the mining camps in the Gunnison country, in my opinion, Irwin was the biggest. Now, whenever you talk about, you start using thousands of people in mining camps, you've got to take that with a grain of salt. What we're talking about is that maybe a thousand people lived in the mining camp, but then two or three thousand were in every ravine and every river and every stream alongside that area. The other thing you want to remember about all mining camps is that there weren't very many here in the wintertime. They were here primarily in the late spring, the summer, and the early fall. Uh, if anybody uh, wants to judge what it must have been like at Irwin at 10,033 feet before snowmobiles, you know, you got a, you got a good, uh, probably good idea what went on. Now, were there ladies of the evening? Yes, there were. Soil doves, ladies of the evening. And they had names in Irwin, and these are legitimate names in Irwin, and I'm not going to go into how they got that name. Hambone Jane. <laughs> Durango Nell. <laughs> Cockeye. <laughs> Obviously a bad eye. Timberline Kate. Here's a good example of Timberline Kate here. Timberline Kate right here. Receding hairline. Timberline Kate. Nan Lum thinks that's real funny. <laughs> Sagebrush Annie. <laughs> Another one thinks it's real funny. <laughs> this lady here, whose name is? My name? Laura. Laura. Laura is known as Pass Out. <laughs> and the reason she's known as Pass Out is that if there's any drinking before business, there's no business. She passes out. So there's all kinds of interesting, interesting names. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of little tidbits here. Uh, this, this came out of the Harry Cornwall memoirs, and it involves a lady named Alabama Rose, a young lady who was here for the summer, daughter of a mining engineer in Irwin, good-looking girl. There weren't too many in Irwin at the time. And here is what happened. There were literally scores of young fellows in camp from good families, well-educated gentlemen, and there was at that time only one girl from similar circles. She was a sister of Mrs. Rood, the wife of the principal doctor in camp, and was visiting for the, for the summer. I do not believe that any girl ever had quite as much attention as her. There are at least 40 young fellows calling regularly. Early in the game, it became very apparent that some sort of rules must be adopted to regulate these calls. So we drew up what might be termed traffic rules and put them into effect. The size of the Reed establishment would not permit more than six or seven calling at one time. And as there were about 40 of us, it was manifestly impossible for anyone to call oftener than once a week. Each was accordingly given a certain night upon which he might call. The appointments were exchangeable between the boys, so if a man could not call on his regular evening, he might exchange with some chap for a different date. The arrangement gave us regular evening attendance of five or six. There were no restrictions on any daytime calls. As George and I, George is his brother, had two ponies and the girl was fond of riding, one or two of us frequently took her out this way. We had an advantage over the other boys, very few of which had horses. There was only one room available in Dr. Reed's cabin. This was about 10 by 12 feet in size. There was a small sofa in one corner. The girl always sat at one end of the sofa, leaving room for one man at the other end. We took turns occupying the seat of honor, turns being decided by lot at the beginning of the evening. Each turn was for four minutes, <laughs> during which time you had to keep talking, the rule being that if 20 seconds elapsed without a word being spoken, your turn was lost and you went to the foot of the line. 
No one except the girl and the man whose turn it was to sit by her could speak. The others sat on the other side of the room. It certainly was hard work to think up subjects of conversation and to keep the ball rolling with four or five scoundrels leering at you with watches in their hands and, of course, listening to every word. <laughs> so here you are trying to make time with the young lady, and the guys on the other side of the room are you know, looking at their watches and, you know, kind of, oh, God, is he going to come up with that story again? <laughs> In any case, at the end of the summer, the Alabama Rose left for home and married her sweetheart one month later. So it was all for naught. <laughs> now, a lot of dances unfolded in Irwin. And because there weren't a whole lot of women, here is what you had to do if you're in Irwin and you're dancing. Men had to take their turn as women. And the way you did that was you tied a handkerchief around the guy's arm and he had to take his turn. <laughs> Anything went. <laughs> Skiing was the only way to get around in Irwin in the wintertime. A lot more about that later. The Bank of Irwin set up a great water system for the camp. A pipe ran from Lake Brennan through a 500-foot tunnel to the edge of camp and then attached hoses to a system of hydrants were used by the citizens. The water pressure, quote, caused by the 300-foot drop from the lake to the camp was tremendous. In January of 1883, an avalanche came off of the mountains and hit the Ruby Chief and the old Sheik mines, killing eight and wiping out shaft houses. In 1891, another avalanche hit the Bullion King boarding house and killed four. All of those who died in Irwin were stored in the snow until spring and then buried. One of, the, one of the most interesting times I ever had. We had a great skier at Western State. His name was Dave Quinn on the United States ski team. He was from Minnesota, Luzerne, Minnesota. And unfortunately, Dave contracted at 25 years old, a very rare form of cancer, and he died. And a good friend of mine named Frank Menson, who was on the team, and I went up to uh, Luzerne, Minnesota to be Paul Bearers. And after the service... They had Dave in a coffin, and we had to carry the coffin into a blockhouse and put it about five feet up on a kind of a you know, little, little area on top, shelf, I guess you'd call it. And inside that room were 12 coffins waiting in December until the snow thawed around May so they could engage in the burial. It was cold. It was kind of dark. It was a little eerie. <laughs> I was thinking of Edgar Allan Poe as we moved in. By 1884, the boom in Irwin had pretty much come to an end. I mean, that's the last great year. Now, periodically, uh, there were more people that would come into Irwin and take a shot at it, but it was all over, and it was all over primarily because of five reasons, in no particular order. Number one, obviously, was the weather. At 10,000 feet and in the snow belt, I mean, it's pretty obvious. If you got five months of mining out of the year, you were damn lucky. The second thing was very difficult transportation. Even when the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad was running into Floresta, the Denver and Rio Grande probably ran for about five months out of the year. Number three, no railroad. Told you last time, the railroad was headed in up Ohio Creek, but then the boom busted and it never made it. But you can still see some of the grade today. Number four, and I, I, I read a great article by James B. Grant from Leadville. One of the top mining men, one of the top smelter men in the U.S., later on went on to become the first Democratic governor of the state of Colorado. He visited Irwin, and he said that Irwin had, quote, knife 
knife blade seams. In other words, the seams of ore were very, very thin. You just did not have the high-grade ore that you had in all those great towns of the San Juan. And then the last thing was the declining price of silver, which ultimately hit 58 cents an ounce in 1893, and that was the silver panic, and every great silver town in the U.S. was done. Three years later in the presidential election, William Jennings Bryan lost to William McKinley after his famous cross of gold speech I talked about last time, and that was it. People have asked me if silver ever came back, and the answer is absolutely not. Today it sells for about $13 on the New York Stock Exchange, but obviously it would cost a lot to get the silver out of the ground. The Irwin Cemetery, right off of Kepler Pass, was dedicated in 1955. And the academic Dean of Western, good friend of mine, D.H. Cummins, came in to, gave the, to give the dedication of Mary. And, and of course, the great grave marker there was of Mary Bamborough, 17 year old girl, died of scarlet fever, 1883. And everybody knows the words on the grave marker. All you people, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I, as I am now, you soon shall be. Prepare yourselves to follow me. And then a day later, a small shingle was placed next to the grave marker. And it said, to follow you, I'll not consent until I found which way you went. <laughs> Some smart ass, obviously, coming in there and desecrating the grave. In 1934, there was a problem over water rights. My father told me, this was nationwide, that that was one of the driest years in the history of the United States, and in late summer, irrigation water became very scarce. Now, Lake Brennan is a source of water for both ranchers in the North Fork around Hodgkiss and Paonia because Anthracite Creek comes out of the lake, above the lake, into the lake, and then goes down into the North Fork. Coal Creek comes in above the lake and comes in to Crested Butte. So you got water being used in two areas. In the year 1934, and incidentally, uh, I'll just give you a little aside here. This summer in August, a couple of my friends and I went up to about a mile before you get to the marble quarries coming in from marble, and there's a little trail that takes you up about 1,500 feet, pretty steep, straight up, and then you go into some of the most beautiful and wild country you can ever get into, and that is the North Anthracite Drainage. You're going over Anthracite Pass and dropping down into the North Anthracite Drainage, and that lady... You know, his body they found, they, they lost her for a while, found the body. She was kind of in that general area. And you go down there about six miles, and then Ruby Anthracite Creek comes in off Kebler Pass, and it forms Anthracite Creek going into Erickson Springs. But if anybody ever wants to take a magnificent trip where nobody gets to, and it's wild as hell with bear scat all over the place, Anthracite Pass about 16 miles all the way into Ruby Anthracite and then down to Erickson Springs. But I digress. What happened in 1934 was that people from the Fire Mountain Canal Company of the Hodgkiss and Paonia area took out and dynamited the log dam. And all, a lot of water flowed right out of Lake Irwin and flowed down Ruby Anthracite, or flowed down Anthracite Creek and down into Paonia and Hodgkiss. They believe that 16 million cubic feet flowed down in August as the ranchers from Paonia and Hodgkiss dynamited that dam. Crested Butte immediately sued against the Fire Mountain Canal Company for disrupting the Crested Butte water supply. And they also charged, and this is actually very true, that these guys at the same time had dynamited Green Lake 
between Ruby and, and Owen Mountains, further depleting the reservoir. Because that's where a lot of the water comes into the reservoir from. The district judge agreed with Crested Butte, saying that the depletion of Lake Brennan endangered the water supply for 1,400 Crested Butte residents. Because Green Lake had been dynamited, a little water flowed into Lake Brennan and Crested Butte residents had to engage in serious conservation. The following year, in March of 35, a judge ruled that the North Fork users only had the right to the amount of water which naturally escaped from Lake Brennan down Ruby Anthracite Creek. In 1961, the earth-filled dam at Lake Brennan broke, almost draining the reservoir and drastically affecting the Crested Butte water supply. I love this one. To obtain more water, Crested Butte residents, residents dynamited beaver ponds along Coal Creek. In 1963, to ensure water, Crested Butte's water supply, the Game and Fish people put in a concrete dam at the Anthracite Creek outlet, which raised the water level to 22 feet. The Forest Service built 27 camp units and five picnic sites around the lake. By that time, Lake Brennan had increasingly been called Lake Irwin. Starting in the 1920s, I got pictures of this, Western State College to increase enrollment, had their students go up to Lake Irwin in uh, March and April of the year. And there are girls in their swimming suits in a little rubber boats floating around Lake Irwin, and there's other girls on the shore putting suntan lotion on, indicating that you're coming to a nice warm area <laughs> if you come into the Gunnison country. Well, as I finish up here, in 1941, a guy named Abner Hahn, H-A-H-N, arrived in Irwin. His father had mined along Mount Owen many years before, around 1900. Hahn was the head of the mining engineering department at New Mexico School of Mines, and he began to revive the Forest Queen mine. His brother, John Hahn, came into Irwin in 1948. He was an army officer, and every summer he would work on the mine until his death in the 1980s, and a nicer man I never met. John Hahn would go into that mine, and I the hell he'd make five, ten feet every summer. I don't think he really ever expected to find anything. It was his hobby. But the thing I remember in the cabin on the Forest Queen mine he had a, a number of supplies, and he had a little note. And it just said, take whatever you need, and when you come back, replace it. And John, I think, died in the 1980s. I, I probably should know the exact date. But as I said, a nicer man you never wanted to meet. Irwin died as a town in 1974 when the Colorado Secretary of State declared it abandoned and it reverted to county control to make it easier to enforce subdivision regulations. We're out of here. <laughs> now remember, we are not meeting next Thursday. Vandenbush got a little surgery to take care of. So next time we will meet will be February the 19th. It's Gothic City and the Slavic experience in Crested Butte. I hope to see you all here. Thanks a lot, folks. See you later.